Roman gladius hanging, hanging there, a real one, not, not a reproduction. Uh, and then, uh, Aaron, if you want to just look, I'm not going to get into showing everything that's on my, on my desk, but, or on my shelves, but those are, that's a partial collection of the 1,000 uh, uh, to 2,000 year old uh, uh, axes and knives and things that I, that I have in my collection. So, you know, I love doing all that kind of, you know, because I love history, so I love to read and all that. So, anyway, uh, those are some of the things I love to do. But what things do you really like to get into and find out all the minutiae of? Uh, history. That, that's really what it comes down to. I'm, I'm after, you know, what are the reasons that, uh, why did things happen the way they happened? Because there's always way more to the story than you got in your uh, uh, sophomore history class in high school, that's for sure. I have a question here um, from Scott Whitner. Scott what is the history behind the Emerson Rhino? The Emerson Rhino? Oh, okay. Um, that's got an interesting history, actually. Uh, I was working with the, a group down at uh, uh, Coronado at uh, uh, Naval uh, Amphibious Warfare, Special Warfare Base in uh, Coronado. Um, and it was the combat fighting instructors. And they were, they were used to using a knife to, in what they call sentry, uh, you know, just to, to kill a sentry, to take something down with a knife. And uh, they had to use a knife uh, from a company uh, that had a real curvaceous blade on it, but they had to turn the knife around and, and hold it, uh, I guess it's tough to describe, but hold it backwards, if you will, so that if, if you hold a regular knife in your hand, it, you know, with your arm extended, the, the edge is pointed, is parallel to the ground. Well, in order to use the knife uh, against someone from behind, you would take that knife and turn it upside down so the edge would be pointing straight up uh, towards the, the, the edge would be parallel to the sky, so to speak, but edge up. So they had to reverse the knife in their hand. And of course, that knife was designed to be used uh, uh, in a downward edge uh, configuration, so that that's the way the handle was configured. So when you put it reversed in your hand, uh, now the curves in the handle were going the wrong direction. It didn't feel right. So they got a hold of me and said, you know, we need a knife that we can hold like a regular knife, but have the, uh, have the edge up so that when you reach around, if you can picture this, if you want to picture this, uh, when you reach around someone's neck and pull it back towards you and across, if you were going to, if you were going to do the old, uh, you know, cut the throat thing, uh, we need to have that edge facing, it has to be on the opposite edge. And so uh, I said, okay, I can do that, and developed a knife that uh, had that curve because it, it's, it's important uh, to facilitate the use of the knife. I don't want to go into a whole bunch of gory details, but curve uh, works better against the neck, we'll just say that. And so anyway, uh, I made that knife with a very, very strong upward curve uh, with the edge on the top side of the blade, uh, the spine, if you will, uh, with a um, handle that you could hold in a normal configuration. So uh, it was comfortable in the hand because the last thing you want to do is, is when you're trying to, to you know, we're, we're talking life and death here. You're, 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 you're touching that other person. And, 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 you know, in order for that to happen, uh, you, you have to be sure that you're in control of the situation. So you don't want to lose your knife. You want to have a good grip on it. You want to make sure that it's, it's, it's going to work as best as it possibly can because there can be no room for error. You make a mistake and then you're the guy laying on the ground with a, with a knife stuck in him, so to speak. And so I uh, developed that knife so that uh, that curve was going up and people immediately said, it looks like a horn of a rhino. And I said, hey, that's pretty that's a pretty good, pretty good name. So we adopted that nickname. It was called the, uh, I think it was called the Silent Sentry Removal Tool or something. That was the, the official designation. But uh, yeah, I developed that for the guys that were working uh, with the SEAL teams and uh, made quite a few of them. And uh, it, be, it became a one of the, one of those knives that uh, you know not a lot of people were aware of, but uh, people in the know kind of heard about it and saw it. Let's just say that. So. That's the story of the rhino. Um, prepare for every day. 
is the blade to handle ratio on Emerson's, which I've seen others complain about the design choice for a specific purpose, or is it just the way they've come out? Um, I don't care about handle to blade relationship. That that those things mean nothing to me. Uh, you know, could I could I design a knife where I could stick another quarter of an inch or an eighth of an inch long blade in it? I don't know, maybe, but you know, for what purpose? But you know, the design is the design. It's, it's one of the reasons I like the uh, uh, the '67 Camaro. Uh, it was designed by one guy, and uh, it has that. It has everything that I want in it. So when, when I design a knife, uh, as long as that knife fits inside the handle and isn't sticking out the butt end of it, uh, I'm okay. I've never paid one second of attention to it. Again, you know, I got it with all due respect to the question and the, and the guy asking the question. A lot of the guys on the internet, you know, they, they, they slice these things up between each other. Uh, it's the same old thing about caliber. Uh, you know, this this bullet uh, is way more powerful, you know, 45 versus a nine millimeter and all that. Well, you, those things only come into uh, uh, effect if, if you put the round on target. So what's the first thing you have to do? You have to be able to hit the target. And uh, there's a lot of guys out there that know a ton of stuff about uh, caliber and ballistics and all that, and they, they slice all that stuff up, but uh, they can't shoot. And uh, you know, what it comes down to is you got you got to be able to put the bullet the round where it is, and then it really doesn't matter too much what the round is. So, again, you know, you can get into those kind of arguments, and you know, people like to say that I've, I've heard that about Emerson Nice. I don't care. I really, really don't. Uh, and you know, again, I'm not saying this about prepared for every day, but uh, don't listen to that bullshit, man, uh, because that's all it is. And most of the people that have those kind of arguments, uh, they've never used a knife in a hard use environment. Uh, and I don't mean, you know, in a knife fight against some guy who's trying to kill you. I'm just saying, you know, I'm from the woods, man. Uh, I used a knife as a tool uh, every single day of my life. I grew up on a farm. Uh, I, I used a knife in, in hard use environments every single day of my life. I, I live on a ranch. <laughs> my, you know, my knives, I use them every single day of my life uh, for, for everything. So I, I use my knife as, as hard as any uh, person probably uses a knife and they do all the things that I need. And again, it's the, here's, here's another one to get, not to get off on the ramp. Uh, Emerson knives, because they're those chisel grinds, they, uh, you know, when I'm cutting cardboard and stuff like that, or if I look at what I can do, uh, if I take a, a piece of paper and just let it cut through the paper, look how the, the cut curves off to one side. You know what, I've used chisel grinds in every environment that exists. I've never had a problem with the knife curving off to one side or the other. I've never had a problem with the, the chisel grind being on the quote-unquote wrong side of the knife. Uh, you know, if you, if, if you have trouble with those things, you, you're not using, you don't know how to use a knife. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like, uh, I, you know, my goal, and in, in, again, back to shooting, my goal is, is, is to pick up any gun uh, anywhere, anytime, and be able to put rounds uh, into the target. Uh, I don't care what color it is, I don't care what it's a wood stock or a non stock, I don't care if it's a short barrel or a long barrel, I don't care if it's a pistol, uh, I don't care if it's a rifle or a shotgun. Uh, my, my only concern is to be able to hit the target. Uh, so again, I don't waste a lot of time thinking about a lot of that stuff, and uh, uh, none of that really bothers me. So, you know, not to sound flippant about it, uh, but uh, you know, a lot of people get into those those arguments about details that uh, uh, that make no difference to me and make no difference in how I use my knife. Will there be any more? Oh, this is Weathers original. Will there be any more ZT collaborations? Yes, there will. Weathers original. Have you considered making new frame lock variants of your designs a mainstay in production? Yes and no. Uh, right now, we're, we sell all the knives we make, and uh, we can't make enough of them. So, you know, doing a specific type of knife, you, you, you look at the knives that we make, and, and uh, we do these uh, signature series knives. Uh, we do sprint knives and things. Those are, those are my attempt to get some new designs out there, because honestly, we don't have the room to 
bring in a whole bunch of new models. We can't justify that because we have tremendous back orders for all the knives that are already in our catalog. And so, uh, you know, you talk to any knife dealer, what's, what's the biggest complaint they have is we can't get enough Emerson knives. Uh, well, we're trying. And so, you know, thank goodness that's, that's a problem that we have, which is that uh, there's a bigger demand than what we can make. So it's tough for us to uh, uh, say, oh yeah, we're gonna just make a bunch of new production models and all that. We can't, we're, we're trying to fill all the orders for the production knives we already make. And so uh, the only way that I've been able to convince uh, my daughter, Megan, who runs marketing and all that, and uh, my other daughter, Rachel, who is our operations manager, uh, and my wife, who is the actual business head of everything, the only way I could convince them to let me make some of my new models was to do these small production runs, if you will, the, the sprint runs, the signature series and all that. So uh, that's that's the only way I can fit in the new models. So uh, probably not going to make uh, production runs of a lot of frame locks just because uh, they take a lot more time and uh, we're, we're too busy making all the knives that we that are already the ones you guys are, are demanding us to, to build. Tony of ten, Tony of one thousand nine. What was the most business, difficult business decision you faced, and what helped you most in choosing which direction to take? Well, the biggest decision, the most difficult decision that I made was uh, to go from being a custom knife maker uh, to starting a production company. Uh, now, why is that? Well, because I was a very, very well-known custom knife maker. Uh, I could have made custom knives for the rest of my life, never done anything else, and, and made a very good living at it. Uh, and probably would have had a lot less headaches. Uh, but I could never, ever make the amount of custom knives that there was a demand for Emerson knives out there. So, you know, we, my wife and I wrestled with that decision, and, and I came home one day from my real job and said, honey, I, I think I can, uh, I think we should start a knife company. That was part of that decision making that goes back to when I discussed uh, my conversation with uh, Les Diasis of the Benchmade. But then they couldn't be an Emerson knife company. Well, there were enough people out there, I believed, that would buy Emerson knives. And so, you know, we basically hawked every single thing we owned. I took all of my retirement money, everything from a, a really good job that paid me really good money. I was a, a prototype machinist and then an engineer over at Hughes Aircraft, which was a dream job for most people. Uh, but I gave that up and said, I want to start this knife company. So, you know, what helped me the most in choosing which direction to take? Uh, that was my wife, Mary. Uh, she is the reason that I have this company because all she had to say was no nope, and uh, we wouldn't be having this conversation here today uh, but she had the faith uh, she she was willing to forego getting in a house uh, she was willing to forego uh, getting a car a new car uh, we drove the old uh, broke down cars that we had for a long long time uh, she gave up a lot and uh, just because of my dream and so, you know, that was the thing that helped me the most. I, I had the faith, uh, but it's not a single, uh, you know, I'm married. And uh, that's not a decision I would make uh, unless we both bought into it and we were both 100% on board with it. And uh, thank God uh, she's one of those people. And, and again, she's, she's tenacious, tenacious M, we'll call her, because once she latches onto something, uh, there's no letting go. And so once we started this, uh, thank goodness she had the uh, she had that tenacious spirit also to, to, to stay with me and to make sure that I was always pushing forward uh, to try and make this thing a success. And uh, she still is, by the way. So uh, thank God I got I got a wife like my like my wife Mary. HKK793, will anyone be stepping up to fill your shoes in the custom maker role of EKI, or will the customs be gone with you? Um, they'll probably be gone with me. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, I don't know how many more years I'm going to be making custom knives. I can design knives all day long, but I, it's, you know, there's times when 
my time is, is so precious now with grandchildren and everything. Uh, um, sometimes I'd rather be spending it with them as much as I like making knives. Uh, you know, I, I love being with my family. And so uh, my son and my daughters uh, probably not going to be out there grinding knives uh, when I'm gone. Uh, don't know the future, but uh, they'll probably be gone when I'm gone. Joe Zig 6 5. Is the battle axe going to make a return? I might be late. Yes, the battle axe will make a return. We're, we're actually building some of those right now. So, Savage, 2 Savage 4 TV. CQC 7 Commander Stories. I love hearing them. Uh, well, I, I, I saw this question earlier, and I just want to show you something here. These books that you're looking at right now uh, are stories of commanders and CQC 7s and, and all the other guys. I'm just going to I'm going to page through a couple and mark some of the pages. I was just looking through them uh, right before we went on air here. Uh, so I earmarked them. Uh, Blah, 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 blah. I retired all my other knives in favor of the commander. Uh, SEAL Team 6 was not around, so it was just all of us U.S. Air Force Special Operation Team guys. Uh, oh, here we go. My old first issue, Al Marcier, uh, sold to me by Colonel Rowe at uh, JFK Special Warfare Center. Retired in favor of the commander. Uh, it cuts up goats. Web gear, thick rubber mats, scraped leather, and sliced like hell. And as usual, not one single hanging roll was encountered to test it on. Uh, Mr. Kofer, we'll call him, uh, U.S. Uh, Special Operations Command, U.S. Air Force Special Operations Command. Here's another one uh, that I marked again. Uh, I continue to serve as the senior U.N. official operating in rebel control areas of Eastern Congo. Uh, I, as feared, the CQC-6 you sent me a few years ago was permanently borrowed by a rogue militia commander in eastern Congo. The incident occurred some weeks ago and was disagreeable, to say the least, uh, and left little opening for civilized discussions. So there's a, there's a lot of stories like that. I've got a couple more uh, here. And, and again, we, we, some of these stories, uh, some of them I can tell, some of them I can't. Uh, Oh, this one I marked. Uh, from, here's from Ted Nugent. Uh, Please tell me more about your world-class knives and all my law enforcement and military friends rave about. God bless you. Blood Brothers, Ted Nugent. Um, this one, this is a, a, an important one for me, anyway. Uh, if you look at it, United States uh, Army Chief of Staff. Those are the guys that uh, sit uh, next to uh, the president when he's in the uh, Oval Office. Uh, it, congratulations on the reputation of excellence for Emerson Knives. It continues to represent, God bless you and your family, the Army and our nation. Eric Shinseki, General, United States Army. Uh, here's another one. Doc Landis, Operation Joint Forged, uh, Bosnia. President, I'm NCO stationed, quote unquote, someplace in Bosnia. I received my green handle CQC-7. In a word, awesome. The other troops on my dad had the same knife, and I was determined to, to get one also. Uh, here's, here's a cool one, uh, two cool ones. Uh, here's another guy uh, in Kosovo. And here's another very cool one. This one is one of the PSD details for, at that time, you'll see in the middle of this picture, if you can see it, that's Ahmed Karzai, who's the president of Afghanistan. Oops, I apologize for doing that to you guys. Uh, anyway, uh, I would like the, I, lo I love the commander BTS. Uh, Etc. Etc. Department of State. Uh, I want to get it for the rest of my team. Uh, 
Mr. Hodges, Kabul, Afghanistan. Again, again, what we've got here is, is just page after page after page. And so the stories go on and on and on. I, I, could, I could read through all of those uh, and bore you with them, but uh, they're out there. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's been uh, a great uh, honor for me to get the, the knives into the hands of the guys that uh, are the real deal guys. And, and it, that's just been you know, a big honor. It's, put, it's, it's introduced some of the most interesting people uh, I've ever known in my life. And uh, it, our, our motto, famous in the worst places, is that's a fucking fact. We'll just say that. Muscle Bill. What is the rhyme or reason of how to know if an Emerson is going to have a backspacer or standoffs? Uh, well, th there is reason. Uh, it might not seem like it, but it, we are gradually matriculating uh, standoffs into every one of our lives, unless I specifically say I want to do a uh, backspacer. Uh, and then what we'll have uh, on the, all the next generation knives will be a backspacer that will fit over the, uh, the standoffs so that uh, they'll have clearance holes to fit where the standoffs are. So if we, if we end up, uh, we've got some designs that we're going to put some uh, accoutrement, if you will, on the uh, backspacers, uh, some uh, uh, window breakers and things like that. So we need a backspacer to do that. Uh, and uh, so there, you may get a knife that, that you can get a backspacer for that has standoffs. Uh, and you don't have to switch them out. You can just drop it on and, and screw the knife back together. But uh, the reason that some of them still have the old style standoffs is they haven't worked their way through the system. We're, we're going to use up the parts that we have uh, before we you know, make a new version of it, so to speak. So some of the older knives and some of the older models, if you will, still have uh, some backspacers. You know, so gradually they'll work their way through. Brian Caldefonso. How old were you when you made your first knife? Uh, I was about 20 years old, and uh, I was a student at the Filipino Kelly Academy. And again, that's a story we've told uh, time and time again. Uh, I don't want to bore you with it, but uh, I made my first knife was a butterfly knife. Uh, and, uh, my friends at the, at the school, because I didn't have the money to afford it, uh, uh, to purchase one, it was made by a company called Pacific Cutlery, uh, which was the precursor to Benjamin. And uh, so I was a starving student. And then uh, once I made one, uh, actually Richard Bastillo, <clears throat> Richard Bastillo, my dear friend, uh, let me borrow his knife. He was one of the head instructors. And I uh, took it home and made a, a, a real crude copy of it. Uh, but what I found out, there were other students at the school who were just as poor as I was. And uh, they asked me to start making uh, knives for them, if you will. And uh, I said, well, if you buy the material, I'll, I'll make the knife for you. And so. A lot of those guys got early Emersons for about uh, $15. <laughs> <laughs> Maze 2K, what are your thoughts on Phil Hartsfield and his contributions to the modern tactical knife? Well, again, Phil, uh, a, a good friend of mine, uh, was the guy who made a, the chisel grind uh, and, and popularized the chisel grind, if you will, at least within the, the custom knife community. Uh, the, the people that I started making knives for, uh, when I started making knives directly for the military, wanted a, a chisel grind uh, feature. And uh, at that time, Phil did not make a folding knife. So uh, they came to me uh, and asked me to do it. And I said, well, I can't do that because you know, that's, that's Mr. Hart, Hartsfield's signature you know, design. I can't, I can't copy his, his thing. And uh, they said, Ernie, we really, really want a folding knife with a um, chisel grind on. So I called Phil and asked him, and he said, well, Arnie, I don't make a folding knife, so, you know, he's, that's what those guys want, go ahead and do it. And he said, and you know what, you're the first guy that's ever asked me. And I said, well, Phil, I, I wouldn't have done it. But if, if you said no, I wouldn't have made it, wouldn't have done it. So uh, he was a big influence, I guess, uh, in the long run, uh, because it was his gracious uh, a blessing to me to do that knife that started the CQC-6 and then became the CQC-7, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, 
yeah, was he a big influence? So he was a big influence on me, and I guess I was a big influence on the tactical knife market. So, you know, that if you go back to roots, that that's that's the Phil Hartsfield influence. So, Candyman 870, 887. I've noticed some knives have serial numbers and some don't. My new battalion does not. Is there a rhyme or reason to this? Um, yeah, yes and no. Uh, all production knives will have serial numbers unless unless uh, our, our unless our machine would break down and we had to get them out there and I, I had to scratch the, the name on them by hand. Uh, but they'll all have serial numbers. The the only thing is, sometimes special runs do not. Uh, if I'm only making 60 knives uh, for a uh, a signature series or something, they might not have a serial number. So, uh, you know, there's no reason to serialize uh, the small batches. So all the productions will have. What is your favorite semi-auto rifle? What is intermediate cartridge or battle rifle? Well, that's that's an easy one. It's like that 67 Camaro. It's the AR-15. Uh, there's no question about it. I, I believe it's probably one of the best uh, uh, hard-use rifles uh, ever designed. Um, there's a million parts for them. I can get parts anywhere. I can get modifications for them. I can customize it, uh, and I can build them. And, and I built every one of them that I own, uh, which I'm not going to go into number. Uh, I built every single one of them, and uh, uh, you, you can't beat it. It's again, it's a battle-proven design. It's still being used all over the world. Uh, the only other gun that, that could even come close to challenging it, uh, and, and it probably beats it in sheer numbers, would be the AK-47, uh, which I, I love as a, as a weapon also, but, uh, you know, I'm not Russian uh, or communist. So I'm, I'm clinging to my AR-15 along with my Bible and, uh, and all that other stuff that people like to criticize us for. What's your favorite activity to do with your grandchildren from Damatol? Uh, my favorite thing is just being around them. Uh, I, I love to play with them. Uh, I love to have them sit in my lap. I love to watch cartoons with them. I love to put Legos together with them. Uh, but the main thing is, is really just being around them. They're, they're, uh, I'm telling you, I love my kids. I love my, my daughters and my son, uh, just like any other parent does. But then there's something about those grandchildren that uh, that's a different world altogether. And, uh, until you have them, uh, if you do have them, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, they're, they're a joy. Uh, you know, as I get older and older, it, it, it just brings me back to my youth uh, to be around those little, those little guys and, uh, and see them discovering the, wor the world uh, every day. Uh, so I just love being around them. They're, they're, they're old enough now that uh, I can actually have uh, many conversations with them. And it's just funny to, uh, uh, and fascinating to hear their take on the world. And uh, I love it. I love every second of it. Can't do it enough. They, Maybe I, I shouldn't make any more custom knives and just spend my time with them and make you happier man. What's my favorite dive bar? <laughs> you can share a story of anything happening at said bar. Well, that goes back uh, to where I'm from. Uh, it's a bar called Mike's Bar, and it was a dive bar. That don't, no way around it. Uh, and that's a back at, up in northern Wisconsin. And every bar back there is a dive bar. Just <laughs> every, my, my daughter, every bar back there is a dive bar. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> You're 100% right. <laughs> and I do have quite a few stories from other bars. But, uh, this one's uh, a funny one because it has a, it's kind of a twist to it. Uh, there was a, uh, a bunch of guys who were working on a uh, uh, paving the roads coming up towards uh, my hometown. And so they were staying in, in town in, in some of the, the, the hotels and stuff that were there, the small hotels. And uh, of course, they'd be down in the bar drinking and all that. And these were these were some rough, tough guys. And sure enough, uh, you know, words ended up being said one night, and uh, a small fight broke out. I was there; I wasn't in, involved in it, but I saw it. And then, uh, you know, what? We're going to kick your ass, blah blah blah, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. All that good stuff was was said as everybody left. And so the next night. Uh, you know, we all went back, uh, loaded for bear, looking for these uh, guys working on the on the highway. And sure enough, they showed up. And uh, you know, a lot of booze was uh, was put down. And then all of a sudden, the big fight started again. And it was a knock down, drag out, you know, spill out into the streets. Guys pounding on each other and cursing and swearing. The police were the police were watching. Uh, and uh, that went away and all that. And uh, so. 
next year, uh, I got hired on the railroad, and uh, I'm out telling this story uh, while I'm working on the on the railroad with the, the crew. It was, it was called a tie gang. We were replacing all the ties on the, on the, a line from uh, my hometown all the way up to, to Superior at that time, Wisconsin. And uh, so there was about 25, 20 guys on that on that crew. It was a whole string of machines, and uh, I was a new guy and. You know, everybody's telling stories and swapping all these these tales and all that. And I'm telling them about the, the big fight, how we beat up these guys and ran them out of town and all this and that. And I see some of the guys looking at each other and like kind of tilting their head and, and everything. And I'm going, what's what the hell's going on? You know, why is this? You know, why, why am I getting that look? And they said, Ernie, do, do you know who you're talking to? And I go, mm, what do you mean by that? Because that wasn't no no highway crew that was coming through town. That was us. And I was telling them how we beat their ass and all this kind of stuff <laughs> and everything. And again, ran them out of town. And here I am in the crew telling the story to them, not knowing they were the crew that came into town. They were railroad men. And uh, we didn't really run them out of town. It was pretty much a draw because was, these were some pretty tough hombres. And, uh, it, it turned it out turned out being a big joke after that, but I remember the guys, uh, you know, Smitty, Z Bart, uh, Hot Rod, uh, Mooney, uh, these the guys <laughs> that I was working with. They were it was crazy just to say, uh, but I told them that story how we whooped up on them and found out that we really didn't whoop up on them and all that good. Uh, there was a couple of those guys who were old Vietnam vets, and I remember one guy, uh, a Hot Rod, uh, had a scar that uh, ran down his entire. Uh, chest and then took a, uh, it was an upside down T and the T went uh, horizontal to uh, his belly. So he had a, a, an upside down T from, basically from his esophagus all the way down to his belly button. And one day I, I'd asked him, I said, what the hell, what kind of operation did you have on it? That, that was, well, it was an operation, but uh, what happened was uh, he was in the Marines and uh, he was in the, uh, uh, I think it was 1967 in uh, Vietnam. And it was the worst uh, beating that the Marines had ever taken, I believe, uh, up until that time. And uh, there was an ambush, and uh, I can't remember the exact name of the operation, but you can look it up. It's 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 a very it's an important operation. He was one of those guys, and he, he had lost his rifle, and uh, he had his 45, and he saw a VC uh, about 30 feet away from him in the jungle. Because again, you know that's a long ways. That's a real long ways in the jungle to see somebody. And he said, I, I pulled my pistol out, and I was, I aimed at his head, and I thought, God, I, I better shoot him in the chest, because I, if I miss, you know, I'm screwed. And in the time it took for him to uh, lower his aim from the guy's head to his chest, uh, the enemy soldier turned and, and burped out a round or two of his uh, AK-47, uh, caught him uh, directly across the abdomen. And he said he went down, and then there was other gunfire, and the, the VC guy took off. And uh, he spent an entire night uh, propped up against the bottom of a tree with his insides. He said, I was trying to hold all of my intestines uh, in my hands to keep them from uh, touching the ground. And he said in the morning uh, when the uh, uh, evac came, uh, he said uh, one of the corpsmen ran right by. He was yelling, help, 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 because there, there were a lot of wounded Marines out there. Uh, the corpsman ran right by him, and he, he hollered, come back, come back. And when the guy showed up, he said, man, I thought you were dead. Uh, and uh, so that's the story of, that's just one of the stories from, from Hot Rod. These were the guys that we were going to whoop up on, so uh, they believe they'd seen their share of the, of the tiger. Um, if you were to take a vacation and time and cost were no issue, where would you go? Uh, couple places. I, I, I think I'd go to Ireland, for sure, uh, spend some time over there. I would also go to Israel, uh, because uh, you know that's the roots of, of Western civilization. And uh, being a, a big guy on history, I would love to uh, travel uh, to places where uh, you know the, the history of, of Christianity, the history, history of Judaism, the history of uh, Islam, everything uh, is centered over there. And so I would love to uh, spend time over there, uh, putting my hands in the dirt, so to speak. Uh, although the Grand Caymans uh, is a pretty damn nice place to go. <laughs> it's, 
spend some time too. I'll just say that. My wife's probably way more uh, interested in going there than to uh, some of the other places. Uh, Bion Cal Bion Cad Alfonso. The question is, why knives? Why not? Best hunting knife style. Okay, J. Scott Ten. Uh, for me, medium-sized blade, comfortable in the hand, uh, something that uh, I don't need a big, long hunter. I don't need, uh, you know, again, I used a buck 110, or I mean a buck, uh, whatever that buck uh, hunting knife was for so long. Uh, I used that for many, many years. Uh, we, make, we make some nice hunting knives now. Uh, the uh, uh, Appalachian, the, uh, uh, help me out here, makes the... CBC uh, 13. The Appalachian, the uh, 13, uh, the Aftershock, 13. Yeah, the Aftershock, um, all the Bowie Market stuff, Skinner. Market Skinner, Market Skinner, which will probably go into production. And, uh, we got the sheep, more. got the sheepdog you know, Bowie, the sheepdog Bowie, sheepdog Bowie. Danny, what's the name of that? Their hunting knife, the Market Skinner, the Appalachian, and the. I think you got them. We have three uh, that are specific hunters, so we'll think of it in a minute. Somebody here. Yeah. <laughs> um, Patriot. We have three hunting knives uh, that are the uh, knives that uh, we've that we designed. Anyway, medium-sized knife that, that you can that you can use. What brought you to begin the Order of the Black Shamrock, and how did you come up with it? Well, the Black Shamrock was a place that, uh, you know, over the years, uh, we, we people that are in the military and uh, people that aren't, but have the same mindset, uh, we, we've taken a lot of uh, flack from people that are, uh, that don't think that, that we're normal. Uh, they, they have a resentment for uh, the people that, that are willing to put their lives on the line to, to protect others. Uh, people that, you know, uh, pick up the, the sword and the shield and run towards danger and not away from it. Uh, which, you know, for me, the definition of a warrior uh, is not a judgmental thing. It's just the way that it shakes down in society. There's people that need to be protected and uh, there's people that are the protector. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with, with cowardice or bravery. Uh, it basically is just the way that it is always sorted out uh, in every society on earth. And, uh, but unfortunately, we've, we've taken a hit uh, in the last few years that, and, and um, we've become kind of a pariah at times. Like, why do you need to be like that? There's something wrong with you, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we get that label. And uh, why, why do you like to fight? You know, you know we don't need you guys. And, 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 uh, the poor police officers right now are, are suffering greatly from that attitude uh, uh, where people are, you know, like, like anti-cop. How, how can you be anti-cop, for Christ's sake? Uh, these the guys can come to your house at, at 2 in the morning and, and, and protect you from the bad guy. Uh, but anyway, uh, I wanted to have a place where people were uh, praised for, for being a warrior and uh, could talk to other warriors and could be in, in a like crowd and like company. And uh, when, then, you know, we realized, all of us, uh, there's nothing wrong with us. Uh, we're necessary. Uh, in fact, we're more necessary today than, than maybe we have been in the past. And so uh, I wanted to uh, enjoy that and to let other warriors, if you will, know that uh, there's, there's a lot of people that appreciate that. So the Order of the Black Shamrock is, is one of those places. Uh, can we get a sneak peek into this is the last question, actually. Can we get a sneak peek into production or plans you have for the future? From Domingo Go Eric Fuentes. Domingo Eric Fuentes, okay. Oh, good Definitely. customer. I'm just mm -hmm. kind of stupid. Uh, so, what's coming up uh, in the future? New designs, new materials, uh, et cetera. Uh, well, the answer is uh, no, you can't get a sneak peek. Because uh, if we do that, uh, other knife companies are going to beat us to the punch. Uh, but I want you to think of this. Think of sitting down at a real nice restaurant 
ordering a nice New York strip steak or filet mignon and pulling out an Emerson folding steak knife. And we'll just leave it at that. Anyway, folks, uh, the rendezvous, that's the name of the other uh, hunting knife that we make. So we've got the Appalachian, the Market Skinner, and the rendezvous to answer that question. Sorry, uh, too many blows to the head over the years, folks. I, I'm, I'm not losing it, but I, I, I misplace things uh, once in a while. So there you have it, guys. Uh, that was uh, today's uh, question and answer. I want to thank everyone for uh, sending stuff in. Are there any more questions coming in at all? Uh, we covered that. Um, someone was asking, I don't know if he's still in the room, but uh, he was dying to know, where'd you come up with the idea for the Gypsy Jack? Oh, the Gypsy Jack. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> it, it all started with a song. Uh, you know, uh, my, my, one of my favorite uh, Irish singers is, uh, oh God, brown eyed girl. Uh, uh, Van Morrison? Van Morrison. And uh, he, he, he has in that one song uh, about, the, uh, uh, about the gypsies. And it just kind of, I thought, you know, I, I like that stuff. I, I've been a student of uh, knife and knife styles and knife fighting and things like that over the years. And the gypsies, uh, they were knife, that was a knife uh, culture and might still be. And uh, so I look back at a lot of old style uh, knives from that, from the, uh, the gypsy culture, if you will, and uh, kind of put things together and came up with the, uh, that style of knife, which was a, a blade heavy, uh, they, they used a knife that was a, a skinny handle, almost like one of those French knives, like Laguel, Laguel, or whatever they call them. Laguli. Lagulis, I can't pronounce French too well. But anyway, that type of a handle, but uh, with a big, uh, you know, blade, uh, all, almost like uh, a folding uh, straight razor with a bigger blade and heavier blade out towards the front. So uh, that was the design uh, idea for the Gypsy Jack. I like the knife, actually. It's just, uh, it's, it's a little too unique for most people's tastes, but I like it. And, uh, but that came, Really, I listen to music while I'm doing a lot of things, and uh, I happen to be listening to Van Morrison. And uh, you're gonna rock and rock me way down to my gypsy soul, or whatever the, the lyrics were. And I, well, it's, maybe I should look at doing the gypsy knife. That'd be a cool thing. I call it the Gypsy Jack. <laughs> um, so that probably wraps it up, right? Yeah, it looks like I don't have any more questions that haven't already been answered. Uh, okay. Well, folks, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Uh, again, this podcast will be put up, but it'll be uh, in, a, in the next week or two. We're, we're, uh, we've got a schedule. We've got a lot of guests. Uh, uh, and, and please continue to listen to the uh, Emerson podcast. Uh, I've got a lot of interesting guests coming up. Uh, a lot of really, really good stuff. Uh, people that I've known over the years and some new friends that I'm making just uh, you know, by having the podcast. And uh, so anyway, just stay tuned and hopefully we'll be able to bring you more and more uh, good stuff. Uh, when we get to a point where we get a lot more questions in uh, over time, uh, we'll do this again. And I uh, hope you liked it. And uh, there you have it. So. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Danny. Appreciate it. Thank you. And, and thank all of you out there for, for I guess, being interested in, in the stuff that, that we do here at Emerson Nye. And uh, if it wasn't for all of you, I wouldn't be able to do the things that, that I love to do. And uh, I thank you all for for anyone wondering, I am going to post these on uh, Instagram Live just so they're there for people to watch all day, and then eventually I'm going to put it on YouTube. Oh, excellent. So uh, you're going to put them up on Instagram Live? Yeah, they're going to be available for, I think, the next 24 hours, and then after that I'm just going to upload it to YouTube just okay. so they can watch whenever they want. It'll end up on YouTube at some point. So. 
That's it. All right. See you later. Sign up.